The sermon text today is Job 38, 1 through 18. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds, its garment, and thick darkness, its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Why didn't I get that promotion? Why did Chuck get it instead? My performance record is way better than his. In fact, Chuck's not actually that good at his job. But I guess he is good at playing golf and going out for drinks with the boss. It's not fair. Why did, why did Ella get so many toys for her birthday. She got another American Girl doll, which makes that her third one. She got a big dollhouse from her grandma, and she got a brand new pink scooter with ribbons and a bell. It's not fair. I never get to have as many toys as Ella. How come Robin's life is so perfect? She gets to spend so much time with her kids and grandkids. Every holiday, they get together, and almost every weekend in the summer, they go to the lake cabin as a family. My kids barely ever call me, and I get to see my only grandson about once a year because he lives in New York. And as for my husband, well, he just cares about his guns and his cars, and I'm left alone in the house wishing that my life wasn't so depressing. No parent should have to bury their own children. And now I've buried two. This grief is just too heavy. God, how could you let this happen? Can you relate to any of these uh, tragic situations? Uh, the truth is that terrible and unfair things happen to all of us eventually. Uh, some of them are, are more trivial, like, like uh, wanting better toys or being passed up for a promotion. Uh, some of them are more tragic, like being lonely or having a dear family member die. When these things happen, it's only natural for us to question God's goodness. You know, if God is in control of all things, why did he let this happen? The book of Job wrestles with these questions. <clears throat> and the book of Job actually invites us to put ourselves in the shoes of Job as we wrestle with tragedy and suffering in our own lives. So who was Job? Well, the Bible doesn't give us a time mark, clearly, but, but certain things within the book make it likely that Job was from around the time of Abraham, or perhaps even before him. In the first verse, Job is described as a man who, who was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. That's the narrator's description, and later on, God himself describes Job that way. And yet, 
God allowed Satan to take away everything that Job owned and about everyone that he loved in a single day. The largest section of the book is, is a conversation between Job and three of his friends who came to mourn with him and to comfort him. As you may have heard before, they were not very good comforters. They let it be known to Job that, that God must be punishing him for his sins. They thought that the only reason so many bad things could have happened to Job was that he deserved them. <clears throat> Job responded to them by defending his own integrity, by claiming that, that he hadn't done anything to deserve what happened to him. And we got to give Job credit because at the very end of the book, when God is rebuking Job's friends, God says that Job spoke the truth about him, that is about God, unlike his friends. But we also should acknowledge that God was not pleased with everything that Job said. There were times when he opened his mouth and spoke too much. This was when Job questioned the justice and the goodness of God. There were times when, when Job justified himself and declared God to be in the wrong. That is where Job went too far. For instance, um, Job observed that God's hand was heavy upon himself, a righteous man, but that God was, his hand was light on others. God was allowing wicked people like robbers and adulterers to go along happily with their lives. How was that fair? Why wasn't God spending his time to punish the really bad people? <clears throat> Job felt that God was not being entirely just in his ways with him and with the world. In chapters 38 through 41, the Lord responds to Job. Uh, he begins by accusing Job of speaking without true knowledge, of darkening counsel. He tells Job to roll up his sleeves and to get ready to answer his questions. And God's first question in verse 4 is simply this, Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. If you were Job, what could you say to this? <laughs> well, here's a tip. When God is asking you sarcastic, rhetorical questions, it's best to say nothing. God continues in verse 5, Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. You see, God is, is showing Job how limited his perspective is compared to God's own complete, total wisdom and understanding. Of course, Job wasn't there when God created the earth. So, so how could he possibly give God advice on how he should govern the affairs that go on the earth. In verse 8, God transitions from the earth to the sea. Verse 8, God says, or, or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? In other words, were you there when I created the seas and, and, and did you make the sea stop from going too far? He, he says, did you tell the seas you can come this far but no further? and your proud waves must stop here? Who put limits on how far the waters could go? Job, do you have that kind of authority? In verse 12, God moves on to his creation and oversight over each new day, over each morning. He says, have you commanded the morning since your days began? Have you caused the dawn to know its place? Job, can you do that? How about us? Remember, we are supposed to put ourselves in Job's shoes. In verse 16, God asks him, Have you traveled to the sources of the sea, or the springs of the sea, or have you walked in the depths of the oceans? You know, with all of our advancements today, scientists and explorers have still seen only a small portion of the ocean floor. There's so much we haven't seen. There's so much we don't even know about the deepest part of the ocean. And oftentimes going down that deep is very dangerous, as we uh, learned from the news uh, about a month ago. In fact, scientists are still finding new species of fish and marine life that, that only live deep, deep in the depths of the ocean. It really is the last frontier on the earth. But not for God. He knows Every species that he created, 
He knows every crater, every spring, every volcano on the ocean floor. God knows every cave, every reef, every jellyfish, and every grain of sand, and every seashell that is far too deep and far too dark for us to be able to see with even the most advanced equipment that money can buy. Next, God moves on to something even more mysterious and more unknown to us than the ocean floor. Look at verse 17. Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Earlier in the book, Job made some speculations about what happens on the other side of death when people die. But I think he was just speculating. He didn't really know. You should know that at this point in time, God had not revealed to humanity very much about what happens after death. I'm thankful that God gave further revelation about this topic as the Bible continued to be written. <clears throat> so Job really was in the dark about death and about the afterlife. Death was a mystery surrounded by deep darkness, and, and, and Job's limited perspective on this very topic really stunted his ability to comprehend the full justice of God. Just think about this. If we do not take into account what will happen after death, then when we see wicked people on earth who prosper and who live long and happy lives, and at the same time, if we see godly, righteous people suffering and even dying young, then where is the justice in that? But could it be that these seeming injustices will be rectified after death? Hebrews 9 says that it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And the whole Bible, various books, testify to a coming day of judgment in which God will render to each person according to their works. On that day, justice will be served. On that day, every wrong will be made right. This reminds me of a story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 16 about a rich man who had many comforts in this life. Fancy clothing, delicious food that he fe feasted from his table every day. But he was greedy. And as an example of his, uh, of his corrupt character, he never helped this poor man, Lazarus, who was laid by the gate of his house day after day. Lazarus was not only poor, but he was covered with, with painful sores all over his body, much like Job actually was. When the poor man died, he was carried by the angels up to heaven, to Abraham's side. But when the rich man died, he was sent to hell. While in torment, the rich man was given a glimpse of heaven, and he saw Abraham with Lazarus at his side. And he asked Abraham to please have pity on him and to send Lazarus down to him and to have Lazarus dip the tip of his finger in water in order to cool his tongue because he was in anguish in the flames of hell. But Abraham told him, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. You see, there was a great reversal after death. Justice was finally served. But, but you wouldn't know that from looking at the earthly lives of the rich man and the poor man, Lazarus. Justice was only served beyond the gates of death. That's why it's a very fitting question for God to ask Job in 38, 17, have, have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Our last verse today is Job 38, 18, where God asks Job, Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this. Again, Job has not, neither have we. And so we must admit that our perspective is severely limited. But how often do we think that we know more than we actually do? How often do we question God for how he governs the affairs of the world, and more personally, how he governs the affairs of my own life or your own life. The truth is, we only see a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of, of complete reality. And with that limited perspective, our best path is to humble ourselves before the infinite power 
and wisdom of God and to trust in him. Job eventually responds to God in chapter 40, verse 4. He says, I am so insignificant. How can I answer you? I place my hand over my mouth. And he finally admits in chapter 42, I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wondrous for me to know. Job repents of his words, and he submits himself to God. By the end of the book, Job is not given a clearer understanding of why such terrible things happened to him. Instead, he got something better. He received a clearer understanding of God. He was given a glimpse of God. He was able to hear God speak to him from his mouth. I believe Paul's words in Romans 11 summarize what Job learned that day. Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who is who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Therefore, let us humble ourselves before the wisdom and knowledge of God. Let us give him the honor of governing the world without calling his justice into question. Let's put our trust in him, no matter what happens to us, like Job did at the very beginning of the book, when, when after everything was taken away, Job said, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But let us also take advantage of revelation that God has given to us beyond what was available to Job during his day. What am I talking about? <clears throat> Listen to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. This is the greater revelation I'm talking about, the revelation of God's Son. It's interesting to note that the Son of God was certainly there when God laid the foundation of the earth. Even more, he was the one through whom God laid such foundation. And now the Son of God has revealed himself to us. He has revealed God to us. In so doing, he has revealed to us the mercy and the justice of God. While the suffering of Job helps us to wrestle with life's difficult questions, it's the suffering of a greater righteous one the Son of God, that actually gives us the comfort and the help that we need. Jesus was blameless and upright. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Like Job, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. But unlike Job, Scripture says that he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And while he suffered, Jesus entrusted himself to his Father, who judges justly. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus suffered and died for all the sins and all the evil that we have committed. And his blood has made atonement for our sins. So that everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins and the sure hope of eternal life. No amount of, of suffering in this world can take away this promise of eternal comfort and joy that God freely gives to everyone who believes in his Son. St. Paul writes that the sufferings of this present time are not even worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed and given to us when Christ returns. And so let this promise help us to endure the inevitable tragedies and sufferings of life here on earth. And when these hard times come, we will be prepared. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Amen.